Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another episode of Project Space Cube, a tutorial where we make a sort of a spaceship building game out of components here. And what we have so far is a system that works pretty well for simple cubes, but once we introduce irregular shapes like a triangle here, you can see that we've got odd gaps over here because we're just positioning things based on the normal vector that comes off of our collision and offsetting things from the center of the object, which doesn't work properly with triangles. That's why we're introducing the technique of these little connector knobs over here that we are going to use to show the possible snap points for objects. And actually, that's probably what we'll name those things is a snap point. So we're going to put one of these little knobs on every spot where it makes sense to connect another object over here. And that's going to be the thing that we use for clicking. So in my cube over here, let me actually rename this little knob here. By the way, I did clearly clean up the scene from the end of last episode just to uh, just to get us back to a good little baseline. So I'm actually I'll call this snap point. I think that's reasonable. Seems OK. Um, and then we got to start to think a bit a bit more. I think I talked about at the end of last episode that one of the things that we do now, of course, is we orientate our parts based on the side of the object that we clicked on. Although you can see here with the triangle, we may have to introduce some sort of twist control afterwards to get the um, the orientation we want. But the the objects are correctly pointing away from whatever we side we click on, which is fine. And we're currently using the normal vector for that. But when we start using these little knobbly bits, we can't really use that as is. I mean, the direction makes a lot of sense if I click right here, but if I were to click on the side of this knob over here, then I wouldn't want my object to attach itself sideways. That's not what we're looking for. So instead, we're going to have to use the orientation of the snap point itself, which leads to an interesting little question. Um, how should this be pointing? Well, if we remember, uh, and this will become especially obvious if say I were to drop in one of our thrusters over here, we have declared that positive, where the hell is this thruster? It's a million miles away. There we go. Let's bring it a little closer. We have de declared that positive Z is the direction that things will be facing in to represent sort of away from our, wherever the heck we're clicking on. Okay, so this orientation of the thruster is correct, which means that this is how the thruster should be facing if it's on the back of the box, which means, and this is with basically zero rotation. The zero rotation state is if you're attaching something to the back of the box. Therefore, our snap point here, if it's got zero rotation, should likewise be snapped to the back of the box like this. And so then what happens if you were to click on this little point when we're connecting an object, all you're going to do is spawn something like the thruster using the same coordinate as this snap point and the same orientation, which would be correct over here, which means if we take this and move it to the front of the box, let's say we have a second one here, I'm just gonna make a duplicate. And this one ends up being at the front of the box, which I guess is negative 0.5 in the Z axis, then this would have to be rotated, say 180 degrees around the Y axis, I guess it could be rotated 180 degrees against around uh, Z, the X axis as well. But now it's facing the opposite direction. But it's not really obvious from here that we have correctly rotated this object. One of the things you can do is you can change your um, your tool handles to go from global rotation to local. And then what you can do is confirm that the blue arrow is facing away from the box, which is exactly what we're doing. Basically, the local Z axis now is facing away from the box, which is always going to be correct. So we could do that. The other thing that sometimes I do is in something like my snap point over here, I'll create another object inside of that. Let's say like another cube. Um, and I just, this other cube, I just sort of like poke it out a bit this way. I rotate it, say, 45 degrees and 45 degrees like that, and then shrink it down to, you know, say half size. And then if we go back to global coordinates and put it in there, so now we have like a little arrowy, like knobby bit to show direction. That's a perfectly fine way of doing it as well. But I think we're going to be okay without doing this. I think we're going to be perfectly fine if all we do is we pay attention to the local arrows. So this snap point here, I'm going to create another duplicate. It's going to get set to a Z of zero and an X of 0.5 like this. Um, yeah, that's fine. And then I'm gonna, oh, that's interesting. Oops, because I'm, I was typing, I was trying to hit, use the E hotkey to go into rotation mode over here. E is the hotkey for that. And if we rotate 
And what I, I tend to do is this. I sort of do an eyeball rotate to figure out what the correct axis is. Ah, ni 90 degrees along the, the, the Y is correct. Do this. And if we switch back to the transform, again, we can confirm that our blue arrow is pointing away from there. I'm going to duplicate this again and swing it over in the negative X direction. And it's going to be a rotation negative 90 around the Y axis. And again, the blue arrow is pointing the right way. That's good. And we're going to go and create another snap point. This one is going to be at a Y of 0.5. And then if we just move like this and go back into the rotation tool, we know because where the blue arrow is pointing, we know what we want something kind of like this, right? That's correct. Blue arrow is going to be pointing away from the surface. So it looks like the correct thing to do there would be something like negative 90 along the X. And actually, we could get rid of the um, the Y rotation because it doesn't actually make a difference over here. So we may as well only rotate around one correct axis. And then we'll get one more snap point over here. I'm just going to... I'm using Control D, by the way, to duplicate this. Um, you could also right click and choose duplicate. My bad. But Control D, very convenient. So now that we've got that, we will get going to stick you at negative Y and we are going to change the rotation from negative X to positive 90 degrees in the X. And again, all the blue arrows and the local axis are now facing away, which shows that our little knobbly bits are oriented the correct way around. We're gonna take a slight change to, well, a couple of things with this cube later on, but for now, we're gonna say it's good enough. I'm gonna go ahead and hit apply. Okay, so now that we've got that, that's great. If I were to go and hit play on this, it would, sort of work, but not really. I mean, I can click on this little knobbly bit and do that. But again, because we're offsetting, we're using the normal vector, we're offsetting from the middle point of this by one unit this way. So, all right, that's not quite right. Let's make a couple of quick little tweaks over here. So if we go into our mouse manager code here, and let's make sure to embiggen this, what kind of assumptions do we want to make? Well, first of all, first of all, and this is quite important, we actually don't want to be able to click on the main cube anymore, right? We only want to register clicks that happen to these little boxes here because these are the connection points because some objects like, for example, our thruster isn't going to have, say, you know, you don't want to be able to click on the side of the thruster and spawn something. I mean, we've sort of dabbled with this already, but not really. So how are we going to get that to work the way that we want? Well, what we want to do in our code over here when we do our raycast, right over here, after we do the raycast, we want to do a test of, did we click on a snap point, right? We know we hit something, but is that something a snap point? We don't check for that kind of, um, uh, um, I, I don't know. We, we, we're not doing any sort of checking to confirm what type of object we've hit. At this point, we've assumed if we hit anything, it's perfectly fine. We want to be able to attach stuff to it, but that's no longer true. We only want to attach something if what we've clicked on is one of these little knobbly bits. You know what? I might recolor this as well. Kind of dig that idea. Um, under images, which isn't particularly accurate, let's go something. Let's rename, label this to something like materials, which is far more accurate, even though it does contain images as well. I'm going to go and create a new material here uh, for matte snap point. And all I'm going to do is tint it green. I think, I think that looks good. Plus, we can do other things later on to showcase things. So what you can do now is because I want to assign this material to all these snap points. Well, I can bulk select this and then drag the snap point into there. There we go. So now they're all colored green. I think that's lovely. We, could, we may want to um, uh, do something like uh, change the emission to, I guess the emission color being green would actually be the correct way, wouldn't it? And then the, yeah, you kind of want both. So emission actually means it'll glow. So it ignores lighting. You can see that it's like super glowy over here. And I think that looks quite good in fluorescent. If you were using sort of um, uh, one of the more advanced lighting models in Unity, and especially if this were sort of a static thing and you were baking in uh, some light maps, then you could actually get green light to come off of these. But I think for our purposes, it's gonna be okay. We could also switch to an unlit shader, but that's not what this tutorial is about. So let's just do that because it looks kind of awesome. Okay, so how do we tell that we've clicked on one of the snap points as opposed to the object itself? Well, one thing we could do, especially if these were all just named, say, snap point as opposed to snap point one, is we could actually just check the name of the object. That's perfectly fine. 
right? Because we could check object we hit dot name. That's something. Uh, notice at this point, the object we hit, we're taking the root of the collider um, to get like the base most object over here, which probably isn't what we're looking to do anymore. But more on that in a second. Uh, so yeah, we could check the name, uh, but that's pretty crummy, I think. The other thing we could do is we can make sure that all the snap points have a certain tag. You can create a new custom tag over here um, and then have all the snap points have that. And you can check the tag of something by going um, object we hit dot tag, which is just a string, you know, does it equal whatever. That's perfectly okay too. But here's the thing. I think, oh, the other thing you could do is all your snap points could have a specific component. You could add a component called snap point with that. But again, we're trying to minimize how many scripts are running in the, um, in our program here. And I don't think there's any reason that our snap points need any sort of like special logic to them. They don't need to run their own script. These snap points need hitboxes, okay? They need a collision box, which they have, they have a box glider by default because we just use the Unity primitive cube. They have a box glider by default and they need to have a collider of some kind for our raycast, physics.raycast to work. Now, it doesn't actually have to be a collider collider this could be i'm going to select them all i'm going to set to is trigger if we do this and hit play and we click here clearly our raycast still hit this knob your physics salt raycast will hit collide or triggers now triggers are not like well triggers by definition don't have collisions right in the physics system if we had bouncy balls going around here the bouncy ball won't hit this little nodule but this nodule will still uh, fire off trigger events when the bouncy ball enters it, which potentially could add a lot of overhead to our physics system. Really, we don't ever want anything to collide or trigger with our snap points. They simply exist to interact with our mouse. Therefore, what I think the best solution will be is actually to create a new type of layer. Oh, you can see here from my, uh, my previous... Um, little, I, I did a mistake over here, which is why it had that in. And you know what? I like snap point as a much better name than connect point. All right, snap point over here. We're making a new layer for the physics system. Then we can go and take all these, uh, these current snap point objects and assign them to that layer. By having done that, what it enables us to do, first of all, we will be able to check in our code if we're hitting something that's on that layer. And what we can also do is in edit project settings, physics, we can go and make it so that the snap point, yeah, you can see my code is already in there from the last time. Um, my, we can make it so that the snap point doesn't collide with anything, right? By default, when you create a new layer, everything is on, which means everything from the snap point layer can collide with everything else and vice versa. By turning all these off, collisions can't exist between those. And I think what this will do is minimize a little bit some of the physics overhead. Um, it may be an unnecessary little step. Well, no, we don't want things to collide. And honestly, we don't want things to get triggered with the snap points either. So I think that's gonna be a perfectly fine way to go about things. All right, so we've got that in there. Great, groovy, wonderful. How do we actually do the checking? So the question is, okay, let's get rid of this object we hit thing, okay? because now the only thing we truly care about is the thing the collider is on. So our snap points are always going to be on the snap point physics layer. We can check this because our hit info dot collider has, um, actually, it's, I guess it's the game object, has a layer assigned to it. And this is just an integer. So we can do something like if hitpoint.collider.gameobject.layer is equal to, well, whatever the layer um, value is, which we can check here, number eight, okay? So we could do something like this. If it's on layer eight, then we actually hit that. And then basically we take all this code and move it in here. But well, let's test this first. This is not the. This is not what our final thing is going to be. But let's take a look at how this might work. So I'm going to hit play. First, I'm going to try to click on the box itself. Nothing happens if I click on the box. But as soon as I click on the snap point, it works. So 
when we're clicking on the box, we do a physics ray cast, it hits something, but whatever it hit was not on layer number eight, therefore we don't do anything. But if it is on layer number eight, then we spawn an object. Okay, that, that's all right, we're there. But I mean, hard coding in numbers like this, that's never good. We could, of course, do something like uh, public int um, snap point layer, right? It would be an integer that we could set. And then we sort of offload the work. If we go here to the scripts, we could offload the work here to eight, right? And then we could use this integer here. All right, that's, that's a little bit better. That is certainly a little bit better, but it's still kind of awkward to have to type in a number here. Is there a better way to do this? Absolutely. You actually in Unity, there is a helpful, what the heck did I just hit here? Go away. There is a helpful, class called layer mask. And what's the deal with this? Well, if we go and take a look at our inspector here, since it's done recompiling, you can see that what it does by default, it lets us pick a layer like snap point. In fact, it even lets us pick more than one if we wanted. We could say everything, we could say nothing. In this case, we're quite interested in saying, ah, snap point, lovely. Okay, so if we do this, and then we're trying to compare things over here. Does this even compile? I guess it does, but it shouldn't work. So if I click on the box, okay, that's nothing. If I click on the knob, nothing happens. Why? I said snap point layer is snap point. And then I'm checking to see if this layer is equal to snap point layer. Why doesn't it work? Well, there should be a little red flag that goes off on your head to say, well, this isn't just an integer, although for some reason, it's letting us do this direct comparison. But the, the, the real alarm that should be going on your head is, what if I had more than one thing selected here? How does this translate into this comparison? How does water plus snap point equal or not equal eight? What the heck does this contain? Well, a layer mask, and I mean, in general, it's just sort of a, a common um, mechanic or co common way to, to work with data to use layer masks, and specifically um, the layer mask class here, is basically internally just an integer, yes, but instead of using the integer as a normal number, you're instead using the integer as a series of binary flags. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's take, I mean, uh, what's the timing in this video? Okay, I'm going to say this. The rest of the video is going to be dealing with um, bitwise operators and that sort of thing. If you are familiar and very comfortable with bitwise operators, you can probably skip the rest of this video. But if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, then stick around. It's going to be fun, probably-ish. Okay, um, the normal integer number value of 8 is represented thusly in binary, okay? Binary numbers, of course, are just ones and zeros. And the way that you count in binary is like this. Well, well, this is zero, this is one, this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I mean, it's 32-bit integer, so it's got a bunch of zeros before this. It doesn't really matter. But 1000 zero, zero, zero is a value of 8. And the way to think about this is the same way that you would think about in um, the base 10, right? When you've got a number like, uh, say, 1845, okay, as a number over here, what this really means is um, 1 times 1,000 plus back up here, eight times 100 plus four times 10 plus five times one, I guess, just for completeness, right? This is how it would work in normal decimal base 10 representation. In binary, the same sort of thing happens where this number means very simply, one times eight plus zero times four, uh, zero times two, and finally zero times one. 
And so if you had a different variant, like let's say you had this number over here, 1011, then this would be this, which would mean, and you add them all together, so this would represent the number 11 is what this is. All right? So that's how a normal integer number works in binary. And this is important to talk about because we're going to re uh, refer back to this in a moment. However, when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about things like layer masks, or perhaps you'll see something like bit masks, or um, f uh, you sometimes you'll just see that like something referred to as like a flag variable, then what you're instead doing is you're flipping bits to represent something. You're saying something like, in this case, this would represent would represent something like the fourth, well, it's sort of like the threeth, because this would be the zeroth, the oneth, the twoth, the threeth. I'm going to say, call it like that. The threeth item in um, the list is enabled, right? That's how we would look at it. The zeroth, the oneth, the twoth, and the threeth item in the list is turned on. Um, so that's what this representation means. Or maybe you would say first, second, third, fourth. You know, it's one of those programming things. How, how are you going to refer to it in this particular example? Well, I guess it would be the fourth. Okay, technically this is the fourth item in the list. But if you're talking about an index, this would be the threeth thing in the index. But it's the fourth thing in the list is enabled, is turned on. And so when you're talking about this layer mask, our, our snap point layer, um, which actually we're going to rename this to snap point layer mask. I just use the F2 key to do a quick rename, which also renames it down here, layer mask to make it clear. So in our layer mask, what this does is we turn on the flag for the layers we have selected over here. So, uh, we know snap point is eight water is, I don't know what layer is water. Let's, let's go and talk about it real. So water is layer number four. Okay, so in this example, we have the fourth thing and the eighth thing enabled, which means in our layer mask, um, if we have something like in this case, um, water and uh, snap point are on. Okay, so water is the fourth flag, snap point is the eighth flag is turned on. So that's what the layer mask looks like. So then how do you actually compare these two? You can't, because you can't do equal. In this case, this should return true, right? Because the, um, the snap point layer is turned on and this is the value of eight, which like dot layer here contains the number eight because we're on the eighth layer. So how do we say, well, we're on the eighth layer is the eighth bit enabled in this layer mask. So this is where we come in with bitwise operators. Bitwise operators and comparators. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that I'm using the exact terminology that you might find in your, your C slash C sharp slash whatever manual. This, by the way, is something that's present in like basically every single programming language because sometimes you need to fiddle with some bits. So um, it's interesting that I use the ampersand here. Let me just go in and do that because the ampersand has a specific meaning. We've learned if you watch, if you're new to C sharp, then you've learned in my tutorial, for example, that something like this, right, is how you say and in a, in a comparison. And I said, you can't just use a single one because that is special. That's actually a bitwise comparison operator. What the and operator does, the single ampersand does this kind of eh, compares two integers and returns a new integer where both had their bits enabled. What the heck does this mean? Well, what we're going to do is we're actually going to be using the ampersand here, not by itself. We're going to do a little bit more than just this, but we're going to be ampersanding. Uh, that's not true. Let me, let me just, <coughs> excuse me, let me just backtrack. Let's make an example for this. Example. If we had the value, say, one, one, zero, one, one, and we were anding this, or ampersanding it, using the, the bitwise, whoops, 
the bitwise and operator like this. And we were doing it with, say, this number over here. The result, doo -doo 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 -doo, the result would be this. We compare each one. First of all, is it, we have one and one. They're both on, so we return one. Then we have zero, zero, they're both off, so that's zero. Then we have a one and zero. Since this is an and, is both the top one and the bottom one turned on? No, so we get a zero. And then in this case, we've got that, right? So with the and operator, you need both of them to be on. Only if and only if both values have their bit turned on in that position, then only in that case do we do that. So if we had like another digit here that was like this, then you would end up with that. Okay, so that's the AND operator. It's also worth noting, and this is incredibly important, that there's an, a single OR operator. Um, this is a bytewise OR. And if we were to do the same example with the bytewise OR here, like this, then in this case, this would return true, effectively, or value of one anywhere where either one is turned on. So in this case, we would get a one, zero, because they're both off, one, one, one. That is with the bytewise or. All right? Okay. So that's, that's lovely. So we're going to use that somehow for this. But again, we can't just, we can't just and these together because think about it. What this would do, let's say I had, let's say I had the snap point layer turned off. I only cared about collisions with the water layer, which is the fourth layer, which means the fourth um, bit is turned on over here. Well, this is my value of eight. If I were to just compare these two, well, then I would end up, even bitwise, I would end up with a one in the result, which would introduce some sort of trueness, right? But basically the way you do it, again, this is not actually the correct final form, is we would put an ampersand in here and we would have to wrap it in parentheses because the bitwise operator is actually quite low in priority. And we would just check, is this greater than zero, right? Because if this bitwise operator, if any ones carry over into the result, then effectively this in indicates an integer that is not all zeros, right? Your, your answer is either gonna be an integer that's all zeros because literally nothing got carried over, or it's gonna be something bigger than zero because one of the numbers got carried over. So therefore, you're just checking to see if this bitwise comparison is resulting in something that's larger than zero. If so, we go for it. Well, in this case, if we were comparing these two numbers together, then this would carry the one into the answer, which would be true. But with my flag set here, I'm saying I only want to collide with things on the water flag, on the water layer, but this is, this is an integer of eight. This is a flag where the fourth bit is turned on. I can't compare these two. I still can't compare these two directly. What I need to do is I need to convert my sort of integer, my number over here into something in this bitwise format. So let me turn this, there we go, the eighth bit turned on again. So how do I do that? Well, we're gonna introduce one more bitwise operator. And this is indeed not a comparison. What this is, is this is the left shift operator. The left shift <laughs> operator. What it does is it slides values to the left in, in terms of the bits. What the heck do we mean by this? It's really not too hard to, to grasp. Let's say, we had the value one, right? Literally just one, which of course in binary is just zeros and a one. And then I said, shift to the left by uh, three. Well, what you would end up with, and this should be pretty clear, is you'll end up with, there we go. So it's shifted over to the left by three places. There's also a right shift operator, which is actually a really good shorthand for dividing by two really, really quickly. But anyway, that's not really applicable to this. So this shift things over to the left by three, which means, first of all, I slightly lied to you earlier um, because I just realized, well, let me, let me get back to you. I'll, I'll tell you why I lied to you uh, in, in, in a moment here. So, which means if we want to assemble something where we want to convert from this integer of eight, which is obviously, this is no good. We can't use this to compare anything, right? This is the example of an integer. It's no good to us in any way whatsoever. But we want something that looks like this. What I was lying about is I said, so snap point is the eighth layer. So the eighth bit is turned on. It's not entirely true. 
Um, it's actually like this because they are using it as indexes. So snap point, yes, is the eighth layer, which is sort of the ninth thing. Like there's a zeroth layer, right? One, two, three, four, and then you get to eight. So snap point is layer eight, but it's sort of the eighth layer because there is a zeroth layer, which is really important for the fact that what we're actually going to be doing here for our comparison is we're going to take the number one and shove it over in this case, eight spaces, right? We're going to shove it over layer spaces, which is going to be eight, which is going to result if we start from the value of one, then this is going to result in, uh, it's hard to count. Let's do it this way. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like this. So it's going to result in the ninth bit from the right turned on. If you know, if you go one, two, three, four, then this is the ninth, but it's the 80th, eighth bit. If you start counting from zero. Does that, I know, off by one problems and it's hard to sort of describe over here. But even though this one is then followed by eight zeros, which means it's sort of the ninth number from the right hand side, this is correctly what happens when you take the number one and you shift it leftwards in eight spaces, which is exactly how the flags are set up for our layer mask. So yes. So if we take the number one, we shove it over to the left eight times, we end up with a an integer with the eight slash ninth bit turned on, depending on how you want to count it. And finally, finally, we end up with something that we can compare to our layer masks. So what we need is we need an integer here that says something like, um, I don't know, mask for uh, this hit object or, or something like that. There's like a couple, you know, I'm being very verbose, but you sort of dig what I'm saying. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it to the number one shifted leftwise equal to our current layer, right? So the object that we hit, right? The hidden foes collider game object has a layer on it, which if we're hitting our snap point will be layer eight. If we're not hitting the snap point will be probably the default layer, which has some other number. So we're either going to end up something with um, the eight slash ninth bit turned on, or we're going to end up with something that has some completely different bit turned on. We, we, we don't know yet because we don't know what we actually clicked on, but that will be in this mask. And then what we can do is we can compare this. We're going to compare the mask for this, this hit object with the snap point layer mask. We're going to do a bitwise comparison. And if the bit that is turned on for here, if it's also turned on in our layer mask, then we will get an integer that's got at least, a, it's got a value of at least one. Depending on which bit's turned on, it's going to have a value above zero. But if the bit that is defined here is not turned on in the layer mask, then this bitwise and comparator will return all zeros, which means the value will be zero. So we're checking to make sure that it's not zero, basically. I guess that might be the better way of saying it. If it's not equal to zero, then we're good to go. So all this to do this, let's give this a try. So we've got our script, snap point layer mask is still set to water and snap point. Let's leave that on for a second. If I click on the box itself, nothing happens. If I click on the snap point, aha, I mean, yes, things are still offset oddly, but we are correctly checking for that. And that's an incredibly powerful tool. There are, so I'm gonna like set this to nothing, then set it to only snap point over here. There are other ways to check to see if we're clicking on this snap point specifically. But knowing how to do this is extremely important because one of the most powerful reasons that we do our Raycast manually in Mouse Manager, instead of simply listening for on mouse over, on mouse click, type events on the object is because our physics.raycast has a variant where you can feed it in a layer mask. So you can explicitly ignore certain things in your scene. By default, if you don't specify layer mask to physics.raycast, it will raycast against everything except the ignore raycast layer. That's the default. But we might want more layers that should be not ignored by all raycasts, but should be ignored by this one here. Therefore, by doing it this way, we could go and make a custom layer mask in here about what should be um, ignored or not. Now, it's worth noting, we don't want to pass, say, the snap point layer mask of this, right? We don't want that because we actually do want this physics raycast to hit 
things other than the snap point, or basically to be stopped by things other than the snap point, right? If the, the, this means the physics raycast layer mask, these are the, all the things that the raycast can hit. So we want it to be okay for it to hit something else, right? And then later we check to see, because we want it to stop. We don't want the ray to pass through everything and then hit whatever snap point happens to be hiding behind that the user can't even see. We want it to be stopped by things, but we only want to go to work if it was stopped by the right thing, which is what we're doing over here. So yes, a whole bunch of that in here. And then if we hit play, again, we are good to go. We won't spawn anything clicking there or on the box. We only spawn things when we click on the uh, the green snap point. Obviously, it's still spawning in the wrong um, position. None of that. But if I click right on the side of the snap point, it, it oh, I don't think I'm successfully doing it. There we go. If I click on the side of the snap point there, which is basically what just happened there, it spawns with a different orientation because we're using the normal vector um, for the orientation, which is not not the way we want. Um, we can actually tune that. I can fix it really easy. It's like a two second fix, but I did promise people that if they didn't need the bit wise operator or the bit wise operator, they could skip the rest of the video. So I'm not going to do it here. We're going to put a cut in here. Next time we're going to keep polishing up our snap points. Thanks for watching folks. See you next time. Thank you to all our September patrons, i.e. people who've pledged in September and are supporting the videos from October to early November, and especially these mic check supporters. We've got Yuko Finn, Ole Peter Talgo, Adam Conway, Drazian, Jan Tori Vell, Adjective, Michael McClintock, Aaron Dobson, Craig Mortel, Stephen Wendell, Julien Auger Lafont, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Stephen Steger, Valiant Cake Fiend, Wes Olenboving, Jason Yanity, Kale the Quick, Neil, Blakey, Milner, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to the series, thank you very, very much.